So really to provide an example more than anything else, um, there are protein families that are basically defined by what, in part, what the, um, what the 3D structure of the protein consists of or includes. Alpha beta barrel proteins, well, as you can imagine, there are alpha helices and beta sheets within that, that structure, and they make what looks like a barrel. Um, now, if you look at the middle, this triose phosphate isomerase, we're getting a top-down view of that protein that kind of has a central pore to it. 10% of all known enzyme structures have an alpha beta barrel domain to them that provides them with one uh, particular structure. Um, reactions that are ca catalyzed by these proteins, however, can be pretty dramatically different. Um, and as, a as such, they also have different primary amino acid sequences. So your take home with respect to protein domains, families, and motifs, and globular proteins as a whole, globular proteins have general characteristics that are very common amongst them. There are only three basic types of secondary structures. Um, and as a result of that, there's a finite number of permutations and organizations that those can take on and for them to interact with one another. <clears throat> The more homologous the primary sequences, the more similar the tertiary structure of that protein is going to be. Certain structures lend themselves to certain functions and families of structure and functions, uh, families of structure and functions, but have very, sorry, they have very different primary sequences. Families of structures, but different functions and different primary sequences exist. And there are the reason, these are the reason it's difficult to predict your tertiary structure. So an important thing to remember is going from your primary to your secondary structure. Chow and Fassman had a very early important review article on that matter. And then that's something that's been refined over the years, getting from your primary structure to your secondary structure. Okay, now it's almost the taken for granted a little bit. Um, going from primary to secondary, doable. Primary to tertiary is much more difficult. Now, in recent years, um, there have been a number of different publications where prediction of protein structure is much, or tertiary structure of protein is much more accurate than it has been in years past. Um, but it's still an ongoing area of research. And this is all about prediction. Compare that to actually solving a 3D structure of a protein using like X-ray crystallography or NMR, that's still gonna be your best bet. But those two techniques have considerable limitations, which we'll get into later on this semester. Now, transitioning to our other types of proteins, fibrous proteins. Fibrous proteins contain polypeptide chains organized approximately parallel along a single axis. They consist of long fibers or large sheets. They tend to be mechanically very strong and rigid. They're insoluble in water and dilute salt solutions. And they play important structural roles in nature. I talked about that with respect to actin and uh, your other like uh, filamentous fibrous proteins. They tend to have only one secondary structure. So Examples would be keratin of hair and wool or fibroin of silk and collagen of connective tissues of animal, uh, including cartilage bones, teeth, skin, and blood vessels. Now, here what we have is a model of alpha keratin. This is found in hair, fingernails, claws, horns, and beaks. The basic unit of alpha keratin is a dimer of alpha helices. Now this dimer of alpha helices is very strong and has a large concentration of cysteine residues. Now, what's unique about these alpha helices is that they are approximately 300 amino acids that form or that fold into an alpha helical rod. The rod segments are capped with a non-helical NNC termini. Now, the primary structure of the helical rod consists of seven amino acid repeats. That's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then N, where A and D are nonpolar residues. So what that means, when you look at that sequence of A, B, C, D, E, F, 
G, well, oopsie, I zoomed in. I did not mean to. Now I need to zoom to the, there we go. Um, this one, this one, and this one are nonpolar. And those are nonpolar because what they are, where they are going to end up amongst these two um, subunits is they are going to end up A opposite D and D opposite A. And so those two nonpolar residues, well, let's think about some good nonpolar residues. Let's say uh, valine and an alanine or an isoleucine and a glycine, for instance. Maybe not a glycine because it's too flexible, but let's just go with that. Those residues are going to attract one another. They're nonpolar. They're going to basically push away any sort of water. So they're going to have this very strong hydrophilic interaction that brings them together. Now, that's going to repeat over and over. And so you're going to have this huge number of interactions that are going to drive these things together. Now, with all that in mind, this is going to repeat. And so you have a dimer. This is what consists of your, your two 300 AA, AA um, helix, helix wrapping up, or your two 300 amino acid helices that wrap up one on another. As soon as that dimer is formed, those dimers are going to aggregate together to form these protofilaments. Those protofilaments are going to maybe not aggregate, but they're going to assemble with one another to form the protofilaments, which are going to assemble to form these microfibrils. I think it's important to recognize and take away from this that you're going from nonpolar interactions that hold this together, that those nonpolar interactions ultimately are responsible for these protofibrils. And another way of looking at this is we can see this, these, we, we were at the microfibrils, um, these microfibrils leading to these protofilaments and protofibrils, which interchangeable terms here, dimer, here's our dimer. Protofilament, protofilament. Microfibril also, <clears throat> your protofibril. These are interactions that are stabilized by hydrophobic interactions. So when we talk about the strength of interactions between amino acids, sure, ionic interactions are the exciting ones because, oh, well, yeah, positive charge and a negative charge, those interacting with one another, that's great. But ultimately, these larger structures all boil down to something like a hydrophobic interaction. Now, those hydrophobic interactions, what they also enable is other interactions to become stabilized. For instance, the protofilament and fibril are... These are uh, associated with one another through a disulfide bond. So this protofilament and fibril, they have disulfide bonds that basically anchor one another to, to each other. Now, what that means is we've got hydrophobic interactions, which kind of set the stage for disulfide bond formation. So just as a reminder, this would be a cis- cysteine cysteine residue interaction and this is ultimately what uh gives hair curls so keratin is rich in cysteine residues that form those disulfide bonds cross-linking the adjacent polypeptide strands now a permanent uh, involves reducing and oxidizing the disulfide bond to change the degree of curl or wave, also known as a perm. A set, wetting and drying, rearranges those hydrogen bonds between the helices and fibrils. Now on a humid day, a dynamic rearrangement of hydrogen bonds is occurring, and that's when we have hair become very, very frizzy. So if you 
had very curly hair then during well most days in central texas this and this are what's going on we have these disulfide bond or disulfide bonds that are somewhat common or they're, they're present but they are rearranged. And so then if you were to like straighten your hair, what you're going to do is you're going to reduce those disulfide bonds and keep them reduced. And then you're going to comb your hair out very flat. Another fibrous protein, silk fibroin. Okay, so actually let me rewind and recap for a second. The a couple of the proteins that I'm gonna go through are just examples. I want you to know the hierarchy here the organization of these proteins, the interactions that hold them together. We've got this alpha helix that's held together, or these alpha helices that are held together through hydrophobic interactions. Those hydrophobic interactions of the dimers ultimately set the stage for disulfide bond formation between protofilaments and the protofibrils. Um, silk fibroin is found in silk fibers. And it's a series of anti-parallel beta sheets that are aligned parallel to the axis of one fiber. The beta sheets stack to form microcrystalline arrays, and what they consist of is alternating sequence of glycine followed by an amino acid, followed by glycine, followed by an amino acid, followed by, uh, and that repeats over and over again, where that X is either an alanine or a serine. And so we have either uh, glycine, alanine, glycine, alanine, glycine, serine, glycine, serine, and that's how these, these structures ultimately uh, align and position themselves. All the glycines on one side and alanines on the other side, each beta sheet is going to be held together by hydrogen bond backbone or hy backbone hydrogen bonds. The stack of the beta sheets associate with one another through van der Waals interactions. So we've got multiple levels of protein interactions or intermolecular interactions that are stabilizing this. Another fibrous protein is collagen. Collagen is the principal component of connective tissue like bones, teeth, uh, cartilage, and tendons. It's the basic, or the basic unit is tropocollagen. This is different. It's a helical structure, but it's different than your alpha helix. It has three left-handed helical chains that are interwoven to produce a right-handed superhelical twist. There's tons of different types of collagen and collagen has a very unique amino acid pattern and sequence to it. Collagen is about 33% uh, glycine. Uh, one out of three amino acids is glycine, which if you remember when we talked about secondary structure breakers, glycine and proline were our two secondary structure breakers that we alluded to. Glycine is a breaker because it's entirely too flexible. So this is kind of weird that glycine is a key part of the formation of this, this fibrous protein structure. Now, there are a couple of amino acids that are derivatives of proline and one that's a derivative of lysine. Four hydroxyproline, three hydroxyproline, and five hydroxylysine are all amino acids that are found within these structures. Proline and hyproline, or hydroxyproline, Together make up 30% of the residues. So this is a structure that has proteins that we generally associate with breakers of secondary structures. So then why are we even considering those secondary structure breakers? Well, one reason is because this is not an alpha helix. These are not alpha helices. These are helices, yes, but they are different from your alpha helix. Now, um, they what one of the things that makes them different is they're more stretched out, they're more elongated, and it's a, a larger, it's a lower number of amino, amino acids per turn or per rotation. So these are elongated. Um, here's your examples of your non-standard amino acids in collagen. You've got your 4 hydroxyl proleal residue. So here's the N termini, here's the alpha carbon, and here's our C termini of our amino acid backbone. So that's number one, two, three, four, five. Um, three hydroxyl proleal, well, here's our carbon number three. 
And then 5 hydroxyl lysyl is going to be a hydroxy group on carbon number five, which would also be alpha, beta, you know, uh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, which would be delta. Um, so these non standard amino acids are formed after the parent amino acids are incorporated into collagen. So what I want you to take away from this is that this protein is synthesized. But then it, so after the non-standard amino acids are formed, or the non-standard amino acids are formed after the parent amino acids are incorporated in collagen. So we have, here is our polypeptide sequence, our polypeptide that's been produced. Then we have a scorbate. Should sound a little bit familiar. Help pirates avoid scar, scar, scarvy, scurvy. Oxygen and alpha ketoglutarate and scorbate are going to come along. And what we're going to end up with is a hydroxyprolyl residue. So we're going to release H2O, succinate, and CO2. That proleal hydroxylase is the enzyme that's going to take proline to that 4 hydroxyprolyl or 4 hydroxyproline. that vitamin C here uh, is required for the enzyme proleal hydroxylase. And if you do not have this, that's where you're going to end up getting scurvy. So this vitamin C as a cofactor of the formation of collagen. So if, you, if you've ever Google image search collagen, or not collagen, but um, scurvy, one of the symptoms is like your gums recede and that's the only one I can think of right now. Um, but this is where you need that. You need to be able to be synthesizing new collagen and turning over collagen and everything like that. Uh, first correlation, yep, was when sail was seen when sailors were given limes, et cetera, on long voyages did not de develop scurvy. Uh, British sailors then became known as limeys, not limes, as a result. So our collagen triple helix, now back to this being a triple helix and each one of these individual polypeptides not being an alpha helix, it's much more extended. Every third residue faces towards the center. Look at this, GG, not good game as if you're playing Starcraft in 1998, but instead, GG as in glycine, glycine. We've got all these glycine residues in the middle, in the central or in the center of this, this helix. Well, let's see, a glycine, it's not going to be particularly polar. It's going to be pretty nonpolar, in fact. And so we've got these tight packing of these nonpolar interactions. Um, and the flexibility that breaks an alpha helix is the flexibility that stabilizes this, uh, these individual helix and this triple helix. Um, proline permit the sharp twisting of the collagen helix. So again, proline being super rigid, well, that's what it, it's utilized for in this case. The triple helix is much more extended, mentioned that. Uh, we, have a, we have three residues per turn, Un, or not, 3.6, which is what we have per alpha helix. Um, so that's one big different uh, different factor. Uh, collagen, the triple helix is stabilized by extensive hydrogen bonds between backbone amide and, uh, and carboxyl groups, but we've also got those hydrophobic interactions. So if you were to look at stabilization of the triple helix, hydrophobic, plus H bonds. Now, if you compare that to keratin, what, carat what stabilizes keratin? Hydrophobic and disulfide bonds. So collagen is unusual cross-linking. Fibrils are further strengthened by covalent cross-links between lysine and histidine residues. The amount of cross-linking is going to increase with aging, which is going to limit collagen's uh, 
uh, flexibility. And this on the right hand side, that's something that you might see in uh, your second biochemistry class, the metabolism class, where you learn about how these different amino acids alter ultimately collagen structure. Now, fibrils are stabilized by covalent crosslinks between lysine and histidine residues. The collagen triple helix is stabilized by hydrogen bonds. Okay, so in both cases, we have in both cases being collagen versus uh, keratin, we've got uh, covalent linkages. We've also got um, hydrophobic interactions. We've, all, we've also got hydrogen bonds in collagen, but not in keratin. So other fibrous proteins, well, gelatin is collagen extracted from the boiled bones, connective tissues and intestines of animals. Uh, processing plants are generally near slaughterhouses. Acids and alkaline solutions are used to extract the minerals and bacteria. Their clean, degreased material is soaked in the hot water to reduce fat content, then boiled to partially hydrolyze and release the collagen. Sweeteners and flavorings and colorings are added, and then boom, you got gummy bears. You got jello. Collagen related diseases um, Ehlers Danlos syndrome. Uh, and here what ends up happening is you have the lysyl hydroxylase deficiency. So the enzyme that's involved in sorry, prolyl hydroxylase. So the enzyme that's responsible for forming our uh, modified lysine is what is present here in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, Hyperextensibility of joints and skin, rubber man type of uh, symptom. So you have these extreme like flexibilities. I don't have any really. Osteogenesis imperfecta, also known as brittle bone disease. Um, defects in type one collagen. Milder cases are caused by replacing with the glycine for a, a bulkier residue. So when you change that from a glycine, that flexibility or so that, that network of hydrogen bonds that holds the triple helix together is undermined. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop and I'll see you in the next video.